Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for free premium picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, it might surprise some people, especially since I know, according to Google, according to YouTube, that a lot of my viewers are in the United States. But it may surprise some people that the biggest fight of the year, at least the biggest in my opinion, both stylistically and in terms of its impact on the sport was not Floyd Mayweather versus Marcus Maidana. I don't believe it was the rematch of Manny Pacquiao versus Timothy Bradley. With all due respect to Sergio Martinez versus Miguel Cotto and Saul Canelo Alvarez against Arislandi Lara. And as much as I like the heavyweight division and as much as I enjoyed the Vladimir Klitschko Alex Lipe fight, and I know a lot of people here are looking forward to Chris Ariola against Bermain Stavern. In my opinion, for the boxing hardcore, for those really with an eye on history, the biggest fight of the year is going to take place, in my opinion, and I know I'll sound like a kook, I'll take that risk. This month, May 31st, in the United Kingdom, between Carl Frotch and George Groves, the rematch. Folks, it really, in my opinion, rarely gets bigger than this, right? Occasionally, you'll have an Ali fight a Fraser, right? But most of the time, the sport doesn't hit this level in terms of drama and excitement. Now, understand, Carl Frotch has fought several A-listers, right? We know he's battle-tested. It might surprise some people, but back in the day, people were looking at Jermaine Taylor as a guy who beat Bernard Hopkins, who's still going, twice. Carl Frotch beat him in the United States. It might surprise some people, but that Frotch Arthur Abraham fight, when it took place, was questionable. We didn't know who was going to win. Frotch dominated that fight. There was a time when Glenn Johnson was viewed as a guy who beat Roy Jones. A guy who was the ultimate warrior. A guy who was the ultimate litmus test. Keep in mind, Glenn Johnson fought Tavares Cloud at light heavy. Right? And gave the champ all he could handle. Carl Frotch beat Glenn Johnson, right? Carl Frotch in the rematch against Mikael Kessler, a guy who beat him before. Carl Frotch beat Kessler. Carl Frotch went the distance with Andre Ward. The one thing you couldn't say about Carl Frotch ever was that he wasn't a warrior, right? Carl Frotch is really the ultimate warrior. When Carl Frotch fought Lucien Boutte, I can tell you I thought Boutte was going to win that fight. Carl Frotch comes out. The bullets start flying. Carl Frotch was the one firing them. Carl Frotch got a stoppage. In my opinion, Carl Frotch is not really fighting George Groves. We know he's really fighting Joe Calzaghe. Understand there are many who view Calzaghe as the high watermark historically at 168 pounds. Understand, Calzaghe beat Bernard Hopkins. The fact that Hopkins has gone on to do many other things just puts added luster. 
to Calzaghi's reputation. Now let's understand, boxing really, while it's global, no question about it, but really the biggest rivalries are local, right? In other words, in the United Kingdom, when Carl Frotch walks down the street, he doesn't want to hear about Joe Calzaghi. He wants the people of his country to view him as at least Calzaghi's equal. Right? The knock on Calzaghi, and let's be blunt, is that there's a question on whether Calzaghi fought enough elite fighters in, his, in their primes. Right? Calzaghi beat reigning champion Sakio Bika. People will argue that he caught Bika too early in Bika's career. Right? The argument with Roy Jones, who Calzaghi beat, is that Calzaghi caught him too late in his career. Right? Fans of Bernard Hopkins believe, at least I believe, that Hopkins is one of the dominant middleweight champions in history. Of course, Calzaghi didn't fight him at middle, right? And when Calzaghi fought Hopkins, I know Hopkins has done great things, but the argument is that Hopkins was no longer in his prime, right? So critics of Calzaghi will say, hey, he didn't take on. Fighters like Carl Frotch took on fighters, right? Because Lucien Boutte was favored against Frotch. Boutte was in his prime. Andre Ward is still in his prime. I know Frotch didn't win the fight. But we know Frotch can go the distance against an elite fighter. Right? Arthur Abraham in his prime when Frotch beat him. So Frotch right now is in a weird place. Because he's fighting the one fighter who could discredit his historical significance in his own country. Actually, there's another, James DeGale, right? Let's say Frotch is fighting one of the two fighters who literally are going to be challenging him for domestic supremacy in George Groves. Now, for the boxing hardcore, Groves is really the worst possible matchup for Carl Frotch. Because George Groves, who calls himself the saint, is faster than Carl Frotch in about every department. Foot speed, hand speed, and of course, what the public doesn't seem to realize is that George Groves is that rare fighter who hits harder than advertised. Now, if George Groves can just bring his A-game the game he brought with him against James DeGale. This fight could be one-sided. Such is Groves' physical gifts. But, let's just say George Groves doesn't make the adjustments in the ring of a Floyd Mayweather. Right? There's a question. And it remains an open question about whether George Groves is able to mentally keep it together in the ring against a dangerous cagey fighter like Carl Frotch for all 12 rounds. Now the first fight is a classic. It would have been a bigger classic. But as it is, it's a classic. It's a moment in time. It would have been an even bigger moment if at the end of the fight the referee had let that round continue. If you're a Carl Frock supporter, if you're a Carl Frock believer, you believe that Carl Frock was on the verge of perhaps his greatest knockout. Right? George Groves knocks him down early in the fight. Carl Frotch gets up. He's buzzed. He has to survive against a faster-handed, younger fighter. He does. 
Then he comes back. He slowly starts getting enraged. He starts hurting George Groves, who curiously is in front of him to be hurt. Then the ref jumps in. Had Frotch gotten that KO, he would be having a much higher profile right now. He'd be completely bulletproof. There'd be no chinks in the armor. But the referee jumps in. It's one of the legendary premature stoppages of the last 10 years. The ref jumps in. George Groves has plausible deniability. George Groves now has the opportunity to say, look, I was buzzed, but I was not about to be dropped. George Groves can claim that a fighter did hit the canvas in the fight. Call Frotch. If they didn't stop it when Frotch hit the canvas, why would they stop it when George Groves, who's ahead on everyone's card, gets buzzed? Also, there are many watching the fight who look at the judges' scorecards curiously. Right? This fight was setting up for an all-time moment because there are many who believe that George Groves was dominating the fight. This is the worst possible thing that can happen to someone like Carl Frotch. The perception that Frotch, who's done it the hard way, travels to the U.S. against Jermaine Taylor, travels to the U.S. against Andre Ward, travels to Denmark the first time against Mikael Kessler. Isn't this guy your prototypical warrior? But yet the ending of this fight left open the argument on whether Frotch got an undeserved premature win. So what you have here are two guys who are fighting for local supremacy. It doesn't get bigger than this. Right? There's folklore on both sides. The Carl Frotch side wants you to believe that Frotch took a kid for granted. Came in a little bit complacent. Got caught. Then did what champions do. Got off the canvas. Got back in the saddle. Took care of business. Right? The Frotch people want you to look at that last round carefully. Because they believe the ref saved George Groves from real damage. Keep in mind, too, the Frotch people will go further. They'll say, look, you saw the direction the fight was going in. Carl had more rounds left to finish the job. Now, the Groves people equally have folklore on their side. They're saying, look at the hand speed difference. Look at how few answers Carl Frotch had early in this fight. Look at how bad Frotch looked getting off the canvas. What is Frotch possibly going to do to bridge the hand speed gap? To bridge the footwork gap? Also, isn't this boxing? Don't fighters get up to 10 seconds to recover if they get knocked down? How come our guy didn't even have the opportunity to get knocked down if he was going to be knocked down? Hasn't our guy come back against other fighters? The Sierra fight, for example. Why didn't this referee give our fighter an opportunity to come back after he got buzzed? And was he buzzed that badly? Let me go one step further. In my opinion, these guys represent two different futures for the division. Understand, Carl Foch has spent his entire boxing career proving himself. We know he's not afraid to fight big names. We know that. Right? Carl Foch is in the stage of his career where he gets to pick his opponents. 
right? So Carl Frotch, if he beats George Groves a second time, won't have to fight George Groves again in his entire career. Frotch conceivably could retire at that point and say, look, judge my career by the level of my opponents, by my willingness to take on all comers. I know that the Gale people will dispute that. But understand, Frotch can say, I fought several tough guys. I proved myself and then I took out a young lion. Frotch could retire. He'd be a boxing hall of famer. Frotch could decide, hey, Kessler and I have a rubber match. He beat me the first time on his soil. I beat him the second time on my soil. Let's take this to Germany, Switzerland, wherever. For a rubber match, that would be lucrative. Right? Frotch could even take some easy fights because he's proven himself. With George Groves, the future is very different. We haven't seen the rematch of Groves, James the Gale. Also, Groves, if he wins, unless it's a dramatic win, early KO, or complete domination, right, a nine-round gap or something like that, he would have unfinished business with Carl Frotch if the second fight is a classic. Given that Frotch has given Groves an opportunity at a rematch. And let's be real here. Frotch could have hit the off-ramp and could have retired. He's given Groves a rematch. There'd be unfinished business. There's the possibility of a third fight between Groves and Carl Frotch. Keep in mind, too, we haven't seen Groves against Andre Ward. Right? Groves might say, look, forget this. I've beaten Carl Frotch. I've beaten James DeGale. That's if he wins. He might just say, look, I'm young. I'm in my prime. Let's take this as far as it can go. Andre, come to the UK. Sign the contract. If I'm so young and if I'm so green... Get in the ring with me in front of my people. Keep in mind, this fight's at Wembley. A Groves Ward fight, just like this fight selling out Wembley, would certainly sell out Wembley. Right? Let me tell you too, folks. A Groves the Gale fight, maybe here in the United States, we're in love with Andre Ward and other guys at 168, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., Right, I'm just here to tell you a Groves to Gale rematch at Wembley sells that out. Would make those fighters millions of pounds. I mean millions. That would be a commercial bonanza. Understand too, this fight, Frotch Groves 2, is a commercial bonanza. I believe the general admission seat sold out in something like an hour. So this fight has it all. Understand too, the Gale is on the undercard. Right? The world needs to be looking right now at 168. This fight has something too that other big fights doesn't have. Martinez against Cotto are two elite fighters. But they're both in their 30s. Right? They've both established themselves. Both of those guys have had long histories of big fights. This fight has a generational component to it. There's 30-something established Carl Frotch. Then there's a different generation. George Groves. Right? You know, in life, one of the things I've learned is the torch is always being passed to a new generation. Is 
Groves ready. Is this a passing of the torch from the Frotch Kessler generation to the Groves, the Gale generation? Right? Food for thought. You know, let me point out too, there are other guys hovering in the distance. Right? Depending on his willingness to gain weight, you have other names that people want to see Groves fight. Should he beat Carl Frotch? Right? His countryman, Nathan Cleverly, was destroyed by Sergei Kovalev. He's hanging around. Right? Let me say this too, and I'll be diplomatic. Bernard Hopkins is a great fighter. No question about it. In his last fight, he threw less than 400 punches. Isn't George Groves exactly the kind of hand speed and volume when he's on his A-game and jab and movement that would give a great fighter like Bernard Hopkins problems? Right? So, let me just say, because of the generational gap between Frotch, old school, and Groves, new school, Right? Because the Super 6 increasingly looks like something that happened yesterday, not today. Because of a first fight that, quite frankly, is a classic. It would have been even more legendary if the ending wasn't premature. But with or without that ending, understand that first fight is a classic. Carl Frotch has fought many people. Has he ever been tested like that? Ever. I know he went down against Jermaine Taylor. Trust me when I say the Taylor fight doesn't come close to the flow and drama of the first Frotch Groves fight. So to the boxing hardcore that might be focused on big names, right? Floyd, Canelo, Manny, name so big, I don't even have to say the, the last name, right? Andre, Bernard, right? Julio. Just to understand, I believe the fight of the year, the best storylines, the biggest gap between the future of boxing, Right, depending on who the winner is. Right, for sheer excitement, for the idea of not who's world champion, but who is the king of their local castle. I don't see how you beat this drama. Frotch versus Groves. Let me just point out, James DeGale is on the undercard in a whale of a fight against Brandon Gonzalez. One of the more underrated talents in the sport. Right? Great undercard fight. Great main event fight. I'll agree. Sergio Martinez versus Miguel Cotto is an excellent fight and I'm looking forward to it. I believe that's going to be a victory lap for the champion Sergio Martinez. Right? I'll agree. Canelo, Arislan Lara, big fight with big consequences. I'm going with Lara in that fight. Here, Frotch Groves. On talent, in my opinion, George Groves should win this fight. But I'll tell you what. experience, mental toughness, if this fight becomes a war of attrition, it's awfully hard to envision Carl Frotch wilting. I like Groves in the fight. More importantly, I think boxing fans are going to believe that this is the biggest event of the year. If you don't know that by now, 
you need to follow the hype these last three, four weeks before this fight happens on the 31st of this month. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Everyone here knows I'm partial to talent, hand speed, foot speed. If Groves can marry ring intelligence with his gifts, he should be Frotch. But of course, I said that before the first fight. <laughs> Carl Frotch found a way. That's Frotch's entire career. Let me hear how you see the fight. Leave your comments for me here online. And also, let's advertise the sport. If there's another fight this year that you think is a bigger fight than this, let us know what that fight is. Thanks for stopping by.